Oki, Abawaktik, Dadanistada, Tansi. Hello and good day, everyone. My name is Heather Magatu, and I'm the Vice President of External Relations here at SAID. I'm honored to be the MC for SAID's commemoration of Orange Shirt Day 2021. Welcome to everyone who's joining us online. I'm glad so many SAID community members can join us virtually. Today, though the institution is closed in honor of National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, we're streaming live from McDonald Hall on SAID's main campus. We'd like to acknowledge that SAID is situated on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy. The city of Calgary encompasses a region that the Blackfoot tribes of southern Alberta described as Mokinstis, meaning elbow, in reference to the location at the confluence of the Bow and Elbow Rivers. Since time immemorial, this region was a traditional gathering place for the tribes of the Blackfoot Confederacy. Today, the area encompasses the indigenous people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, the Sigsika, the Pekani, the Gainai, the Sutena, the Stony Nakoda First Nations, including the Chinakee, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary, of course, is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. I am pleased to share that yesterday we raised the Treaty 7 flag on main campus. The flag will serve as an important reminder and acknowledgement of the tr traditional territories on which we live, work, and study. You can help support Indigenous learners at SAIT through the Kokums Cassegate Endowment Fund or the Métis Education Foundation Endowment Fund directly or by purchasing an Every Child Matters t-shirt. Please visit sate.ca slash Orange Shirt Day for more information. Orange Shirt Day is an opportunity to reflect on the residential school experience and honor those who didn't make it home, the survivors, and their families. It's also an important part of SAIT's journey of reconciliation and decolonization. Today, we're very grateful to have Elder Chief Vincent Yellow Old Woman join us and share his lived experience of residential school. He will then host a vigil so that we can collectively reflect on the announcements of more than 1,000 unmarked grave sites at former residential schools this summer. Before we hear from Elder Chief Vincent Yellow Old Woman, Clarence Wolfleg will sing the opening song. Clarence is from the Siksika Nation and has been singing and drumming for more than 35 years. As a child and youth, he danced the prairie chicken dance and grass dance. He has drummed with many groups on the Pow Wow Trail. Please join me in welcoming Clarence. Hey, oh! Thank you, Clarence, for that stirring opening. Now please join me in welcoming Elder Chief Vincent Yellow Old Woman. Chief Vincent was previously the chief of Siksika Nation. Born and raised there, he experienced a chaotic childhood, enduring the abuses of Canada's residential school system for nine years. As a young person, he struggled to find the ambition to live a healthy lifestyle, but went on to realize many achievements, both personally and professionally. Today, he travels throughout North America as an elder, providing spiritual counsel. Thank you, Chief Vincent, for being here with us today and sharing your experiences of residential schools. I am uh, so honored to be here and to be a part of the, uh, the, the honoring that uh, Saint is doing today. And uh, first of all, just want to thank uh, uh, Skip for the, the song. The, and I think it's a, a good way to start to honor the, the, the traditions and the legacy and, 
and our culture and what it means to us, our songs and our dance. So we, that was a flag song. And uh, our flag song has been around for many years. And uh, the word has been used time from memorial. And this song has uh, our flag songs that's been rendered in many different events. Those songs have been passed on from generation to generation. So I just want to thank him for that. It's a powerful song and uh, we're still here. And so I just want to uh, acknowledge that and thank him for rendering that, that good song. I don't know how you want me to start. Uh, do you just uh, want me to share my story? Yes, please. And then, uh, and then when I'm done, I can turn it back over to you. That would be perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just for those of you are, that are listening, from time to time, I will speak in Blackfoot. Uh, uh, but what I'll do is uh, when it, that time comes, I hope not too many times, because I know there's a lot of listeners out there that don't understand Blackfoot. But it helps me to, to get my thought going again in the, in the direction where I want to go. And uh, a lot of times in, in Blackfoot, I greet everyone in Blackfoot, and I thank the, the institution here for allowing us. And so that's what I'm going to say in Blackfoot. <laughs> My residential school experience started in 1958 or 1959. I was six years old at that time. And uh, we have Orange Shirt Day and uh, today. And the story about Orange Shirt Day is about when she went to residential school on that first day when she went to residential school. On her first day, she was told to take her clothes off. But before she went to residential school that day, she was excited with her grandma to go get a nice orange top. And she was excited. They went to the store in, in Williams Lake, and uh, they shopped. And she picked out a orange top that would just she liked it, the colors that brought her excitement and so forth. And uh, when she went to residential school, she was excited to wear her orange shirt, her orange top. And when she got to residential school, she was told to remove her clothing. And that was the last time she ever saw her orange shirt. I had a similar experience when I went to residential school. When I went, arrived in residential school, we were all lined up and we were told to remove our clothes. And uh, when we were done removing our clothes, uh, they took us a, a shower and uh, there, were, there was one, two, three, four, if I can remember, four shower heads and there would be about five or ten boys using one shower head were all being showered. There's a lot of little boys at that time. And uh, we were told to shower, to clean up, and we had to scrub, really scrub hard. They gave us uh, brushes that were, that were really stiff and soap that, uh, with big heavy soap bars they gave us. We used it from head to toe. That was my experience, and, uh, and I remembered that. And 
Then I had many showers after that. The first day of school, the next day, the teacher walked into our room, the classroom. She said, probably in English, good morning. I don't know what she said. But we could not understand her because I spoke fluently in our language and I could not understand people that spoke the English language. So I didn't know what she was saying. And to make a long story short, I remember at one time I was crying and uh, they would bring older students into the classroom to help us understand what the teacher was saying to us. And when, when the older student came, here's what I said in Blackfoot. I still remember those words I said to the older student. I was crying and I, and I said to, to the older student, what I said was that I don't understand what she's saying to me. Uh, what is she saying to me? And that's what I was saying. And I, and I, and I said to, to him, I said, uh, she's just getting mad at us. Uh, and, and so I, I was very emotional because I did not understand. And uh, we tried very hard to, to understand the English language and we, and we were punished. And later on I realized that what the, the residential school purpose was to, to, to get rid of our culture, to get rid of our language, to get rid of who we are as native people. And at that time I was just a, six-year-old boy, I didn't understand what was going on and fully grasp the, 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 the moment that I was in, I, I didn't understand. I, I, I wanted to know so much of what they were trying to do, but they weren't giving us that opportunity. And we were just giving us a lot of rules and we had to abide by it. And we had to be careful what we, what we said and how we said it. And then later on, I realized, we realized that, uh, you know, they're trying to change us. They're trying to make us different, uh, uh, make us who they are. And those, of, those people that study history will realize that uh, way back in the early 18, 1900s and in the late 1800s, there were legislations that were passed and uh, the government of the day back then wanted to gather up all the native students across Canada, uh, whether it be First Nations, Inuit, uh, Métis, all of them to get them into residential school. And, uh, and this is harsh times to say this, but it's a reminder. And I just want to thank the school for, for the opportunity to share this. I, I think the, uh, the prime minister said one time, uh, Justin Trudeau said, it's not a First Nation issue. It's not a... Uh, uh, those people, it's not their issue only. It's a Canadian issue. So it's something that we all have to work together. So when I realized what the, the decisions that were made back then were pretty harsh. Mm -hmm. When I look back, when I got older, and I realized this is what they were trying to do. They were trying to kill the Indian in the child. And one of those ways was to, to get rid of their culture, to get rid of their language, to get rid of our, our values and, and so forth. And today, symbolically, we have um, two chairs here. And, 
And I just want to draw your attention to the, to the two chairs here. The two chairs here represent those students that went to residential school that never made it home. So if you could imagine a six-year-old boy, a six-year-old girl sitting here, for whatever reason, she was killed at residential school and put in a unmarked grave. And so these chairs represent those voices, those graves that today are being found. And it's, 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 uh, it's emotional for me, and, but that's the truth. When, I, when it dawned on me, and the more I th thought about it, and how I don't know the words to describe what the government was trying to do. I, it, it was the words like crew just doesn't, doesn't justify what they were trying to do to us. Uh, genocide to get rid of us maybe, uh, but we were just uh, in the way, in the way of what? They saw the fast land of, of Canada from all the, way, all the way west to uh, Vancouver Island, and, and the, the land that was there, and underneath that land, there was a lot of value to it. And so what they saw, the government at that time saw an opportunity to, to sell the land and to make money out of it, but there was one problem. There was First Nations in these territories. There were First Nations that lived in this part of the region all the way up north. And how are they going to get rid of them? How are they going to uh, get those Indians out there? And one of those ways was to assimilate them. And one of those was to start these residential schools. And you have today someone saying, well, uh, the minister of the day, uh, I forget his name, Duncan Campbell Scott, did not say kill the Indian in the child. It was McDonald. Then they blamed the United States for starting that. Well, to me, I don't care. Yeah. I don't care who started it. But it was set to, to get rid of the Indian problem, to kill the Indian in the child. And, and what are they trying to do? Are they trying to say, no, it wasn't said so, but that's the reality. And uh, the reality of those legislations that were passed back then. And I am a wall in those residential schools. This is an old structure we're, we're in, and I'm very thankful to be in the institution today to, to see this. If these walls can speak, what would they say mm -hmm. that took place here 25 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, whenever this school started, what would these walls say? The survivors are the walls of the residential school. And I'm going to tell you something. Not only the, the, the culture and the language, these children that were never found, they, did, they probably never saw alcohol in their homes. They probably never saw drugs in their homes. They probably never saw what we see today, what we call the word dysfunction and the abuse and so forth. They were taught good values. They were taught good traditions from their parents, from their grandparents, like I was. I was taught some very rich values. And I couldn't understand why they wanted to get rid of that. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand why they were working so hard to get that out of me. And, and these poor children, when they died at those residential school, they were accomplishing the order, they were accomplishing 
the, 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 the staff of those schools, the, the mandate that was given to them to kill the Indian in the child. And, uh, and they covered it up. And uh, so I, I, I think about that, and, I, and, I, and as I think about my time in residential school and wanting to learn more of what I need to see what's happening to us as First Nations today, these kids that were found, we need to go back to some of the rich values that they were brought into those schools, what they had. I had powerful values that were given to me by my parents, by my grandparents, and so forth. And someone asked me, how did you make it through all those years in residential school? It was those values. It wasn't what I got in residential school, no. It was the teaching, it was the values that were given to me. And these kids died with those things. Mm -hmm. And when they were put in those graves, they cover up those graves and they decide, we're not gonna tell anybody. And I'm so thankful for those uh, people that did the hard work of uh, residential school. And they went across Canada, and I'll talk about that later. I do want to say one thing. People have said, uh, what happened to you in residential school? People always say to me, what's wrong with you, Fins? What's wrong with you, Fins? What? They couldn't understand me. Because what took place in, 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 in my life in residential school, I built I call it a protection wall. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to get hurt again. Mm -hmm. I didn't want somebody to come close to me because I was vulnerable as a six-year-old and I didn't know what was happening to me. They came close to me and I, I let them come in and they took advantage of me. I started getting uh, abused when I was six years old. And uh, before that, uh, that school year end, I was sexually abused by, by the staff and the priests of the schools. And that, I, I take no pleasure in, in, in sharing that. But I do want to say that it's true. Those stories about the sexual abuse that took place in residential school, it's true. And people need to know what took place and how awful those, those times were for me. And uh, I, I grew up an angry teenager. I grew up and I didn't trust anybody. And I would get into trouble and I would fight my way through. I just didn't know how to trust. Still to today, and at uh, seven years old, I still have struggles of of trying to allow people to come in into my life. I, it, 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 it done me harm, a lot of harm. And uh, so I am so thankful uh, from the bottom of my heart uh, of what the, the commission, the TRC group did. And I'm gonna name those individuals. Um, Justice uh, Mary Sinclair one, and, uh, and uh, the chief from, uh, uh, I forget which reserve he's from, from uh, Obima area, uh, Willie Little Child, and Dr. Marie Wilson from BC. Those three I remembered. Uh, they did an excellent job, a powerful job. I remembered uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Justice uh, Murray Sinclair saying, uh, when he was given the mandate to go across Canada to hear the stories of residential school, he said, I was kind of prepared to hear myself what, what was going to be said. I kind of had an idea what probably was going to be there. So he was mentally 
preparing himself from the stories that he was going to be told. For six years he, was, he heard those stories. And he said, but when he got to the part of those unmarked graves, when he got to the part of those children dying at residential school, when he got to the part of those children being killed at residential school, when he got to the part of the, when the, the stories of these children being fern, uh, burned in the furnaces, when he got to those parts, he said, it is very difficult. And that's what residential school is all about. It, it, it. Somebody says to me, what's wrong with you, Vincent? Oh, how come you're... And people couldn't understand. And there was, I was embarrassed. I was ashamed to tell my story. It was only some time ago, not too long ago, that I started to open up because I, I knew when I saw some of my friends and some of my colleagues that went to residential school, and some of them, and I would think, are they going to the same challenges, the same struggles that I went through? And when I would sit down with them, we would talk. Yes, we were going to the, and they said, how did you, and I said, well, we got each other. We can talk to each other about this. We can get over it. And then I realized the, the two of sharing, and, and this is why I'm so glad that, that these guys, uh, these three individuals, did the hard work of hearing those stories for six years. And it's six years later now. And uh, six years later, they discovered those graves in Kamloops, 215. What has, has happened since from day one, 12 years ago to now? Not much on the government side, not much. I always say to the people and to young people and uh, to people like yourself, the Creator put us in this world today, this generation. You, can, you could have been born 200 years ago. Those of us in this room could have been born 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago. But in the wisdom of the Creator, we were born for such a time as this. We're here today, and I am grateful for that. It took the, the courage of those three individuals uh, to hear those awful stories from survivors that took place in residential school and when they finished, they came up with these volumes of recommendation, 94 calls to action. And uh, they put them on the table. And uh, Murray Sinclair said, if you put them all together, you put them on the weight scale, they weigh 25 pounds. And, but with technology today, they can uh, give you, I don't know what it's called, <laughs> a chip or whatever it is, but it's all condensed into that, and you, you can read that. One of those 94 calls to action is to let the people know. So we have today an opportunity to do something that has never been done before. And that's why I'm grateful for the school for allowing me to come, allowing these two individuals to come into the school and tell their stories, to tell their stories. These two individuals that are sitting here now have a voice. And when I'm done talking to you, these two individuals want you to tell their stories. They've given you. And then what they're saying to you is that you could have been born a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, but you're here today. What are you going to do about us? What are you going to do? Are you going to keep us in the grave? You're going to keep us covered? And those people that are watching, and I'm going to tell you guys to, today, what are you going to do with these two individuals? 
What are you going to do with these two individuals? Are you going to keep them in the grave? Like never, it never took place? I'm challenging you and what they want you to, to, to hear the stories of survivors. And they're saying it took place, it happened. The government of Canada made those decisions. One of you could be listening and you could be the next prime minister. You could be the next premier. You could be the next leader making laws in respect to First Nations, in respect to, to the country of Canada. Are you going to continue to cover these people and these young people? So I am grateful for, for the opportunity for allowing us to come and visit the school and bring in these two individuals to, to speak to all of us. And they have a heart and uh, they love their culture and they love their parents. I know they did. I know they wanted to go home. I, want, I know they, like I was told by my parents, it won't be long, you, we'll get you. They would take us to the residential school on a, on a team horse and we would ride in the back of those little box wagons and we would be so happy and these children went to those residential school and they believed their parents. They knew their parents would not lie that they would pick them up. And they were looking forward to it and they never, never made it home. They never made it home. But you can help us. You can help us. And the school here can help us. And uh, I just want to give you an opportunity to ask me some questions if you have any, or if anybody has any questions on those that are watching. Um, I'm not an expert, I'll do what I can to, to answer those questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chief Vincent, for sharing your story with us. Um, and I, I wanna say how much compassion I feel for the little boy that you were, and how much admiration I have for the man that you've become. You are, um, you're a wonderful speaker, and we, we're just so grateful that you've chosen to share your story with us here at SAIT. So for those of you who uh, have been watching us online, if you do have a question, please submit it through the Ask a Question tab in the online platform. And um, Chief Vincent has said he will answer um, your questions live. So please feel free to ask your questions. And maybe just to start off, I, I have a question for you, uh, Chief Vincent, and it is about language. You talked about going to residential school and that language was one of the things that was tried, that tried to be taken from yeah. you. But I, I've also heard you share your language with us here today. And so I wonder uh, if you could talk a little bit about how you retain your language and how important language is. You know, I am so thankful in, in, in residential school that I had relatives and, uh, and the other boys that were there so we continued to communicate and uh, we helped each other. We helped each other in our language. And uh, somebody would pick up uh, 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 or understood what was trying to be uh, told to us. And so we would help each other in that way. So I'm thankful for our language that we were able to, to say things like that. And then when and when we didn't know what was going on in the room, we, and somebody picked up on that, and the power of the language was able to, so we tricked a lot of the staff. <laughs> <laughs> we, we uh, they thought we were, we were obeying, we were just obeying them for what they wanted to do, mm -hmm. but we didn't like what they were doing to us. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so I, I, I am thankful for our language, the beauty of our language. But the sad thing about our, our language, it, it's been lost. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it, it, I bear the responsibility for not passing it down to, to my children, my, my grandchildren, now my great-grandchildren. 
And so the onus is on me, and while I'm still alive, to teach that to my, my children, my great-grandchildren. So we're doing that. And uh, so I want to encourage so mixing AC puiksi, so may tak at stuki kichi puksindung, akuka sitsip satusi, kukusining, sakaitsinikwe. So I, I just said in Blackfoot uh, what I just told you. So. Oh, thank yeah. you. Okay, so there is a question from Hector Flores. It's in two parts, Chief Vincent. Uh, the first part is, were there any kind souls within the residential school that helped you overcome your heartbreaking situation? If so, how did they help you? What did she say? So we have a question. That, were, there any, were there any people at the residential school who were, um, you know, who were able to be helpful to you in your situation, and how, how did they help you? Uh, of course, we had the, my, the fellow students yeah. that, that helped me, if it wasn't for them. Yeah. And uh, they helped me immensely. But if, you, if, if she's, I don't know if it's a him or her. Him. Uh, if she's looking for somebody in the school, no. Yeah. But we helped each other. Each other. Yeah. And then on weekends, we would tell the stories to uh, some of our older so like I was the baby of my family, mm. so most of my siblings had gone to residential school, wow. and uh, so they uh, they would tell me, watch for this, listen for that, do this and that. So that's how we helped each other. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. The second part of that question is, uh, what can we learn as a society to take action when we see injustice from your experience? There's a lot. I, I, one, one of the things that I, I, I heard Murray Sinclair say last week, I, I, I really enjoy going on Google and uh, I follow him mm -hmm. wherever he goes on Google and on the internet. So, and, I, and I was listening to him speak last week and the question was given to him about today, the TRC. Uh, and he said, it's a start. Yeah. It's a start. And he said, but we have a long ways to go. And one of those 94 calls to action that I just uh, mentioned, we need to sit down, like what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And I think you need to hear what these guys are saying, yeah. what these two are saying. And I hope the viewers would have a question for these two individuals here. What would you ask these two individuals here? Maybe we couldn't answer them, mm -hmm. but I, what would you say to them? I can guarantee you they had, they had good upbringing. Yeah. They had good parenting skills. They knew how to survive. They knew how to prepare the meals. They knew how to go hunting. All those values, traditions that we and our prayers and our ceremonies were given to these. And so, mm -hmm. I don't know if I answered that. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another one here. Um, so this is for Chief Vincent as well. Uh, how can we best support the indigenous community as we all work towards reconciliation? What we said was we can sit down together. Yeah. And, uh, and I get a lot of calls, people saying, we want to help. Then I would throw it back to them. Well, what can you do to help us? Yeah. Yeah. What can you do to help us? Yeah. Uh, and I would tell them right away, we don't want your money, but I, I want, I'm eager to know what do you want, how do you want to help us? Yeah. And they would say, well, we don't know. So then I would say to them what I think they want to hear, and I'll say, well, you guys need to do that. So that's what I mean. So I would throw it back to them. And uh, so I think the best way is to, uh, to, to do what you can to understand the, the native culture, First Nation culture across Canada. If you live near to, to a reserve, near, have friends in a native community, 
befriend them, get to know them, uh, go to the museums, go to uh, uh, Blackfoot uh, Cross and Historical Park, uh, go to the, the, the fairs that we have. We have celebrations every summer. Uh, you can go on Google and you can find out a lot of stuff about uh, native culture and the list goes on. Once you have a good understanding, it doesn't make you an expert. Like I can study all of your culture, every one of you guys in the school. Am I an expert once I know your culture, your, your, where you came from and so forth? No, it just tells me a little bit about who you are, uh, a little appreciation of who you are, what makes you, that's all. And that's, so then we have a foundation we can grow together. What I, I have three events today. Uh, today I started off here at the school. This afternoon we run down to Sixaga. We have another event going on. And then this evening uh, we go to Strathmore High School. I would encourage people to go watch New Blood. That's the story of my residential school experience. And uh, it's a drama. Skip uh, sings there all the time. Mm. And uh, you see him again, you hear him sing. And uh, those are some of the things you could do at the beginning and uh, do what you can. Mm -hmm. But don't come in with this, I'm here to save you and I got all the answers for you. And you're this and that. No, we don't want that. Okay, another question here. Um, so of the 94 calls to action from the TRC, could you share a few that we as an educational SAIT community can specifically help with? I think the, the one that I mentioned was that we need to communicate to each other. We need to learn from each other and so forth. I think we could do that. I think we could reach, reach out to each other and that's a start. I think we could, uh, we can go a long ways. And I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for, for your staff member here, uh, Blair Cunningham. And, uh, and to be honest with you, I didn't know he was, he was First Nation. I was, and when he met and he said, I'm Blair Cunningham, right on. So. <laughs> You need more people in institutions like him. And, uh, and I think the more you have those kind of individuals, uh, Six Gown members, guy in uh, Blackfoot Crees, mm -hmm. Métis, you know what? The more you have people like that here, uh, you get a good appreciation. And I would like to see uh, if, if this was called Southern Alberta Native Institute of Technology, <laughs> what will jump out to me would be the word native. Mm -hmm. And then I come and I see all the pictures of the directors. Mm -hmm. And I see all the pictures of the presidents. And I see all the pictures of the vice presidents. And I see all the pictures of the staff. And then I find way in the back a picture of a First Nation. Mm -hmm. Institutions have to change that. Yeah. And uh, I shouldn't have to dig hard. And uh, w it's the onus is, is on the school mm -hmm. to open those doors to open those doors. Here's what, I'm glad that question came up. Here's what the Prime Minister of Canada, here's what the Prime Minister of Canada said. When he went to school, he said, I went to a very good school, a very good school. Well, his dad was the Prime Minister. <laughs> so he had to go to a good school. Justin Trudeau said, I went to a very good school probably a very expensive school too, private school, I don't know. He said, I went to a very good school. And he said, 
I studied all the things that were taught, that everyone's taught in Canada. And he said, when we got to the, 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 the subject about First Nations across Canada, you know what the teacher said? Here's what the, the Prime Minister of the day said. When we got to that, he said, I was eager to learn the history of First Nations about Canada, what happened to them. The teacher said, we'll just skip that. It's not important. I hope that this institution and every school, universities, post-secondary, think it's important. Mm -hmm. And uh, today, the province of Alberta can hit a home run by in their curriculum to put the history of First Nation. They won't. And that just breaks my heart. Yeah. They have an opportunity to, to do that. And I've talked to them and I said, you need to talk to people that are our are, are elders, our are educators in our own communities. We have teachers, we have principals. They're the experts. They can help you guys develop a good, good curriculum that would be a part of the the, the schools in Alberta. They won't do that. So, yes, and I'm thankful for that. And that's the prime. You, you can Google that. Uh, uh, you will find that remark by the prime minister when you go to uh, the, the announcements of the, the TRC mm -hmm. 94 calls to action. It's a three hour. Uh, I sat through the whole three hours, and I saw that. And I kept going, wow, wow. So you can roll the tape on that. Thank you. Okay, just a few more here. Uh, so you mentioned that it was the values instilled in you by your family that helped you get through the residential school experience. Which values in particular helped you the most? Of course. I always say this, First Nations are spiritual people. We're very spiritual. That's very, very, very important and very valuable to us. And uh, that was taught mm -hmm. by our parents. And these children were taught that. And they went to the grave. They're probably when in their last few seconds here on earth, they were doing the prayers that were taught to them by their parents. That was a rich value. And uh, you, you learn how to, to survive. There were things that uh, I remember going trapping with my dad. Yeah. I remember going hunting with my dad. I, uh, I remember it, uh, uh, doing a lot of stuff, fishing and stuff like that. And... Uh, my grandfather was involved in the Sundance. We would go to the Sundance every summer. And uh, so there's a lot of religious, traditional, and cultural factors. And my, my nephews today are very, still very much involved in the Sundance. And, it's, and I'm very proud of them. And uh, so I'm, they're, they're carrying on those traditions. And so the, the spiritual part of who we are, and Skip singing that song, and uh, those songs, I enjoy going to, to powwows. And, uh, and uh, I like to take the front row at every powwow. If you move your chair in front of me, I'm going to get mad. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm proud of who I am as, uh, as a first need. But anyways, uh, yes. Any more questions? Did I answer that? I think so, yeah. Why don't we do one more and then we can move on here. Um, so one of the questions is, what needs to be done to have true reconciliation and change in Canada with respects to, respect to First Nations and Canada on a nation-to-nation -nation basis? Yeah. <laughs> I laugh at 
the word nation to nation. It's been used. It's it's almost like mm. it's it's been thrown out. It's a, like I was a politician for for many years, and uh, they don't treat us nation to nation. They don't treat us, and uh, uh, they don't consider us as sovereign mm -hmm. nations. And uh, so we need to work on it. every First Nation community needs to work on. Uh, on their constitution, mm -hmm. their laws, and uh, have their own court systems. And like the city of Calgary, it has its own bylaws, it has its own, and First Nations need to move towards that. And so when you get to that word for nation to nation, then it's truly nation to nation. Mm -hmm. Really today, First Nations reserves are treated as municipalities mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. well said. I don't agree with that but right. the treaties were broken yeah. and uh, so those of you that are listening in the school here need to realize that our our parents or great grandparents what they what they saw happening when the signing the treaties took place they, they realized that it was important, it was key. You know why? Because they saw the pipe, uh, the sacred pipe. And to First Nation communities, when they see the pipe, uh, they know that person that you're talking to cannot lie. Mm -hmm. They feel, com it's like a Bible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You open the Bible, mm -hmm. and uh, I know that person can't lie because of the Bible. In the same way with First Nation communities, when back then when they saw the, the pipe ceremonies and the bundles, they knew it's supposed to be honored. What they said, they're going to hold them to it because of that. And so they believed that, but it wasn't. Little did they realize that they didn't yeah. appreciate and understand the value of those, those means that we use to help us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Chief Vincent. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. Um, and thank you so much for sharing your story here with us today. I, I think it's so important that we continue to educate ourselves and to learn um, as we continue on this path to reconciliation. So appreciate it. I would like to invite uh, Clarence Wolfleg to sing a song before Elder Chief Yellow Old Woman leads us in the vigil. Please. I was going to sing, a, I was gonna sing the Ganeta Peak song, but I was just listening to, to uh, list, uh, Vincent there, and I just thought this song would actually be a little bit more appropriate for what we're going through now in this reconciliation. And it's just about, it's called, um, it's my uncle, Late Uncle Mark Wolflake Jr. wrote this song for the Blackfoot, uh, well, it's now Blackfoot Crossing Singers, eh, when they were younger. And, and it just talks about Nesua, the Blackfoots went on a journey and they came back, eh, and they came back in a good way. So I just thought I'd sing this song, so here we go.
Clarence. Now, Elder Chief, yellow old woman will lead us in a prayer and smudging. We had a smudging earlier today. Um, and we'll begin the vigil in memory of those, those lost to the residential school system. Give me uh, two candles of those. Heather, you want to grab one? Those candles. Just bring one over here. And then when I'm done praying, you can put one on the chair and you too. I was to pray to you, Pamuxi, Pukaxi. There's a moment too, you can command a cocoon away. I can extend a cup of some week and exist to quit. Maki time it all took Sanniki, any time scrap quiz to pray to you. I no sinikin strip is a noxist to quit. I no good to eat a cut to sir. I want to say my prayer in Blackfoot, and then uh, I'll say it in English for those of you to understand the meaning of today, and what it means. And I just want to thank the school again for opening their doors. I was surprised to be open to Christi Kuni Kiksumachi Pinan. Anokamo Heather, it's in a wash here more Tuscany March Tokyo. Ostre Uchikayin Nisano, it is Tuscany March Kokuisi, Takitin Kokshin Nan, Danish Tokuishin Nan, Toto Pishin Nan. Kanokamuksi, Pukaiksi no cheap with Pindan, Matono Takayu Waxa. Matonos get a makichip step piece of our coa likes. Extonata kaita pee is to pat a pee of a nixe pukaxi. Matonos kakai waxa. He took kuya itaskin mat kyo. Kyoxaskin mat kyxi. It sucks seek him out. One is to talk here. we come this morning with uh, with a heart that wants to work together and we pray this prayer that 
we will certainly have that heart to reach out to each other. And like I said, I know that it's been hard for me to put that wall down simply because of what happened to me when I was a young child. And as I think of these young people that never made it home, these children that never made it home, no fault of their own, they didn't do anything wrong. And, but now today they are being discovered. And I just want to thank the school for allowing these two individuals to come into the school symbolically representing over 6,000 or more unmarked graves. And thank you for allowing the walls, the survivors to come in to tell our stories, what took place in residential school. So now I pray that, that the staff here and those listening, watching, will not just honor this day, but to begin the process of reaching and working together in a good way. May we see a good day where all people are created equally and we respect each other and we honor each other. May we see one day where we work together enhancing humanity in the way it should be, our Creator, what you intended it to be. We know, Father, you are with us today, and we are so grateful for that. And so as we come right now, my prayer of blessing for this school, my prayer of blessing upon those that are watching, upon everyone, and I thank the courage and I thank the strength of those survivors. And I thank those families today that are still mourning and waiting for their loved one that never made it home. I don't know how those are going to be dealt with, but I do pray for those families that are longing for their loved one to come home. And Father, I just pray for these ones here. We've allowed them to come in symbolically to tell their stories and that we should never forget and help us never to forget. May we open our hearts to the truth, what the government did back then. We pray that we open our hearts to the truth the facts that really took place in residential school. May we open our hearts to reconcile with each other, to reach out to each other, and to appreciate the culture of who we are. So with that, I thank you, and I appreciate your love, our Creator, for us in a good way. No tatsumois, kukukit kuksena, anna kaiis chini nistunnan, kita ennista kumimuksena, ta kukkonoa kumimutsisinnan, ma tsitsi panna kain itse puutuonna, ai johtsi paitakio, no ksumukinna anna no kristikue, no kumman, anna itse tapua kahpina, ma kukitsuka pissi, instoa pissi. Thank you, Elder Chief Yellow Old Woman. To end our vigil, Clarence will share a song to honor the children who never made it home.
Thank you, Clarence. I'd like to invite everyone to please join us in a moment of silence to honor those who were lost, those who survived, and their families. Thank you. This concludes today's event. Thank you all for joining us, and many, many thanks to our guests, Elder Chief Vincent Yellow Old Woman and Clarence Wolfleg, for sharing their stories and talents with us today. I encourage everyone to continue the conversation about the legacy of residential schools in your classrooms, within your teams, in your homes, in your communities. Please take the time to explore the resources tab within the event platform to learn more about ways to support our Indigenous students and how to further your own education on decolonization. We also would appreciate you taking the time to complete a quick survey about today's commemoration. Thank you again, everyone. Take care and stay safe.